It is my privilege to talk to you today. I got completely rocked by that vignette that was put together. And I want to thank you on behalf of Ted and all the speakers that are upcoming for your generous listening. Without your listening, I would have nothing to say. So this talk is about the future. And I invite you to listen to this talk for what is possible, not what has already come before, but what can be invented that would deliver something that would clean up all the messes in the world. This talk is called Walk, and you'll see why in a second. So consider the classic Sufi parable of a man walking down a street who runs into a stranger looking for something under a street lamp and bends down to help the stranger. And inside of helping him, the stranger says, thank you. And the man after a while looks and looks and looks with, with the gentleman and says, I can't find your keys. Are you sure you lost them here? To which the stranger replies, oh no, they're in my house, but the light is out here. I want you to consider that we are looking to invent the future within the light. And all that's in the light is the known yesterday and the past. The future is not known. It lives in the dark. And where we are searching for it, we won't find it. I have a two and a five-year-old. This isn't mine. <laughs> what is this baby doing? Well, the obvious answer is it is trying to walk. And from the point of view of it's trying to walk, it gives you a completely different point of view of what this baby's up to. But I want to give you another context for what this baby might try to be doing. And it's a context for this entire talk. Consider that this baby's not trying to walk. Consider that this baby is simply trying not to fall. And what's the difference? It's all the difference. If this baby's trying not to fall, the question is, what gives this point of view? Well, if I'm trying not to fall, I must fear and risk the idea of walking. Hence, I would try not to fall. That's the point of view I approach walking with. And inside of the fear and risk I have about walking, I will hang on. And what will I hang on to? I'll hang on to a past called crawling. And effectively, when I hang on to crawling, all the while trying to walk, I crawl upright. Except all fours aren't on the ground anymore. Two of them are on a wall now. But effectively, all I'm doing is crawling upright. And, instead of, and inside of crawling upright, the result certainly will be that no falling will occur because my interest is in not falling. And I will fulfill on that by not falling. At the same time, I won't walk. But I certainly won't fall. I want you to consider most of the world inside of a context of not falling. And one way to say, say it, the idea of walking is something to be survived. Not mine either. <laughs> Cheryl, my wife, that's not mine either. <laughs> this is Xavier King. He's somebody's in the UK. And Xavier King has a very different point of view when it comes to walking. Xavier King has the point of view that walking something to be tried. And in six months, Xavier King walked. Most kids don't walk under nine. Of the 700,000 children in the UK born a year, Xavier King was one of two to three that year that walked at six months. And there's a whole bunch of reasons that people say for that. I want you to consider why Xavier King walked is because he tried to walk and he stopped trying not to fall. And why did he do that? Because walking was something he was open and alive to. Walking was an opportunity. And instead of being open and alive to walking, Xavier King let go. He let completely go. He's letting go right now. And what did he let go of? He let go of a past called crawling. And it didn't look pretty. And inside of letting go of the past, 
Xavier King fell and fell and fell until one day he walked. And he walked at six months. Now that moment that he walked was no average moment. In the moment Xavier King walked, one second, six months and one second was different than six months. At six months, Xavier King's body only supported falling. So as interested as he was in walking, he had to fight his body's natural interest in falling, and he fought it. But at six months and one second, transformation occurred. At six months and one second, where his body at six months only supported falling, now his body only supports walking. You really want to get the power of transformation. In a heartbeat, if Xavier King wanted to fall, his body says, what are you doing? Do you get that? Do you get the power of transformation? When you and I are fully inside of a created future, nothing of the past looks the same anymore. Xavier King did not survive walking. Xavier King created walking. That is the distinction that you and I are interested in. The future derives from creation, not surviving it. So the talk is about not surviving your future, but fully stepping into your future. How do you think I felt stepping into this stage right now? I had moments of surviving this, and then I stepped right in. And I'm fully alive in this moment. They are a world apart. Trying not to fall versus trying to walk give two different lives. I'm offering you the interest in creating a created life versus surviving your life. No matter how much a baby tries not to fall, it will never catch a baby that tries to walk. So, what is this phenomena called surviving and what's this phenomena that I'm pointing to called creating? Well, consider one definition of surviving is surviving is modifying what we already have, trying to make a different or better yesterday. And consider most organizations and people in the world have an interest in making a different and better yesterday. Creating is a completely different animal. Creating arises from a future that wants to happen. Something that hasn't happened yet. Something new is brought into existence in creating. And they're a world apart. Creating is a game changer. It's not a different yesterday. It is a game changer. Like Xavier King experienced at six months and one second, the game changed. Even his body's not interested in crawling anymore. So, let's look at some game changers because the distinction game changer is a world apart from different and better. Walking is a game changer. It's not a different kind of crawling. Riding a bike is a game changer. It's not a different kind of walking. The game changes. Leaving home is a game changer. It's not a different kind or a better kind of living at home. Leaving home has you meet the world, and you're not the same after that. Having your heart broken is a game changer. Some of you right now are living with the game that was changed after your heart got broken. And you're not the only one living with it. Who you're married to or a partner with is living with the game that changed after your heart was broken. It's not just a different kind of sad. Having sex is a game changer. It's not a different kind of holding hands. I hope for you. <laughs> or else you're going to get your heart broken if it is. Pregnant is a game changer. It's not a different kind of not being pregnant. All right, and birth is a game changer. Trust me, when my wife and I had our two and five-year-old, we looked at each other and went, what now? The game changed. Okay, and then we, you know, I changed with the first one, and then the game changed again with the second one, right? We have a third one, who knows what that looks like. Death is a game changer, obviously. <laughs> but I'm pointing to it, but not, it's not just a different kind of living. Death is death. But it's a game changer for those who you die in front of. Some of you are living with death now as a game changed for you. So the, dis the distinction game changer is something that's profoundly different from different. Okay, this whole conversation about innovation. Inside of innovation, why I'm pointing to the difference is because I'm going to lay out the case that innovation is not 
considered as a game changer. It is considered as more and better and different of a past. Here's Webster's definition of innovation. The introduction of something new. So far, so good. Consistent with what I've been saying. However, the example Webster gives is, through technology and innovation, they found ways to get better results with less work. Well, better and less of what? Better and less of today. Better and less of what we already have. That's not a game changer. Innovation in our world has been collapsed with simply making something different. You and I are not interested in different. You're interested in game-changing ideas. All the Webster's done is define a better yesterday. We don't have time for a better yesterday. The game's got to change now. Consider in 1914-15, when, when World War I ended, this is the Maginot Line. France's idea of, of innovation was to create the Maginot Line so that a, a, a generation of boys was not wiped out again as it was in World War I. Three billion French francs got, got put towards building the Maginot Line. In World War II, the Germans simply flew over and went around because this form of innovation was not innovation. It was a better yesterday. Can you see the distinction in making a better yesterday versus creating something that's actually a match for the future? The Maginot Line is simply a better yesterday. We don't have time for better yesterdays. They won't work anyway. Survival startups in Canada, 145,000 startups in, in 1999, 137,000 startups wiped off the planet, 1999. 2006, 164,000 startups created, 200,000 startups wiped out. Bottom line, 95% of all startup companies' initiatives generated in any given year will fail within the next five. And of the survivors, 90% of the survivors will fail in the following five. And there's a whole bunch of reasons around circumstance and timing and money and business plans. Consider that the human beings starting the startup are inside of surviving their startup and surviving the future that this startup is. We see the world through a rearview mirror. We walk backwards into the future. One of the most prolific Canadians ever. Better yesterday. So, the intention of the talk is to get really disconnected from survival as a way of delivering the future and get profoundly related to creating game changer as the context for generating the future. Facebook, game changer, change your relationship to each other. Apple, iPod, change your relationship to media. Not a different relationship, fundamentally altered it. Hand washing, I, and I, I put hand washing in there because it doesn't all have to be up there, right? Like you and I are game changers. Hand washing, somebody just said, you know, we just wash some hands here, <laughs> right? Hand washing changed the relationship to staying alive. Synthetic biology, in, in my past, I have, you know, I was a geneticist. Synthetic biology, trust me, it is changing your relationship to life. You know, in five years, when you have something wrong with an internal organ and somebody gives you an off-the-shelf synthetic bladder, right, you'll realize how synthetic biology has rocked this world. Google, an obvious game changer. Google has changed your and my relationship to knowledge. Now, Google is also changing your relationship to driving. Google's inside the, the, the leading-edge technology of generating the first driverless car. Why? Because their first game changer, Google Maps, has given them an edge in generating something completely out of the realm of possibility when they did Google Maps. Because they own all the data of the world, all the GPS, all the maps, all the street maps, they can use that to create a car that can drive itself now by sensing where it is in the world. And the first car they have generated has traveled over 1,000 kilometers without a human being touching it. It's gone through Lombard Street in San Francisco, hairpin turns, crossed the Golden Strait Bridge, on and on and on. Why? Because of innovation that was game-changing. Right now, this month in June in Nevada, I'm going to say the first place in the world will make it legal 
to drive inside of a driverless car. That is a bloody game changer. Okay, so what now? Inside of game changing, there are, with unstoppable conversations, and we're not the only ones, we stand on the shoulders of giants. What is it to do practically that would have you and I get interested and master game changing as a way to live life from versus living a life that you and I survive? Number one, ask the question, what is wanted in the future that would make a difference? There's no pronoun here. Not what I want in the future. What is wanted in the future that would make a difference? And I'm going to use interface carpets or interface as one of the key drivers in this uh, example. Ray Anderson at Interface Carpets had one of those moments, as he calls a spear through the chest, where he transformed his thinking about innovation and his company. So I'm going to use Interface to make this point. Interface's answer to this question was, the future wants our company to redefine its stewardship in environmental uh, leadership. That's what they came up with. Step two, wildly paint the picture of the future fulfilled. What would this future look like? When will, when will we have it fulfilled? By when will this be done? Interface's answer. Eliminate any negative impact Interface has on the environment by 2020. That's a real specific future by a certain time. Step three, ask the question, what kind of people would I, we have to be to create this result? Because we can't keep being us. Us got us where we are now. Who do we have to reinvent ourselves to be to be a match for that future? Interface's answer, committed, leaders, innovative. Now that's a straight answer. That's not pretending I am that. I'm not just doing a good job at it. That's saying I have not been that. I need to be that. Step four, create actions consistent with being that kind of personal organization. Interface's answer, committed employees innovate. Portable creeling, which I have no idea what that is, <laughs> has created a 54 reduction in yarn usage. Leaders, be the first to adopt PV, uh, photovoltaic mo modules. You're not, they're not waiting, okay? And innovative, feedback on current energy consumptions of dropped energy consumptions in all interface plants, 43%. Simply having something say you're using this much energy, like the Prius, has somebody start to be responsible for their energy usage. And step five, be ruthless in measuring and publicly sharing your results so that you ensure your accountability, especially when you don't want to be accountable. This is uh, Interface's answer. Since 1998, these are their results, publicly published. 30% renewable energy usage across the world in their plants. This is the largest manufacturer of carpets in the world. Okay, let's get back to Xavier. As regards to Xavier, you and I are Xavier. You, already have a, you are already a game changer. Trust me, when, you're ki when you were born, you changed the game for whoever birthed you. You just forgot you're a game changer. No matter how much you try not to fall, okay? No matter how much, you'll never match somebody who tries to walk. And you are somebody who can try to walk. Let go of yesterday. Walk. Thank you.